Hi, everyone. Welcome to DMLC and today's session called Providing a Meaningful Student Leadership Development Experience Through the Lens of Giving Back. I am excited to introduce Ali Imsweiler and Pete Hunter from Jagathon at IUPUI. Um, they are going to be leading this session as part of the advisor workshop at DMLC. Um, we're excited to hear from them. If you have any questions that come up throughout this presentation, please make note of them. Um, and then at the end of today's presentation, we'll direct you to the Discord channel where you can message Pete and Allie directly and get answers to your questions. Um, but now I am excited to kick it over to Pete and Allie. Well, thanks, Andrew. And welcome everyone to our advisor session. My name, as Andrew mentioned, is Pete Hunter, and I serve as the Director of Development uh, on the IUPUI campus with the Indiana University Foundation. Um, I have had the privilege of advising Jagathon for, uh, this is my ninth year I'm going into. I'm excited to uh, share some information with you and I will uh, let Allie introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Allie Emsweiler. I am a Development Associate um, with the Indiana University Foundation on the IUPUI campus. I have been advising Jagathon with Pete since about a year ago, August of last year, but I was with Jagathon five years previously with that as a student. So um, I'm really grateful that the dance marathon experience kind of led me to my career path. So as far as our agenda is concerned, we have uh, broken down the session into four primary pieces. Uh, one being to provide leadership and professional development opportunities to our students fostering student success, garnering campus and community support, and then facilitating program growth. Now, a couple caveats with that. Um, if, as you're watching this presentation, if you have uh, any aspects of it or any, any curiosity within uh, this presentation that would make you wanna take a, a deeper dive into any of these topics, uh, Allie and I would very much welcome um, some outreach. We would love to talk to you about what you know and. Um, what, what you've experienced on your campuses. Um, we're seeking to learn as well. And we wanna acknowledge that we've, you know, we've been at it for a while and, and, and um, um, several years of experience within Dance Marathon and, and on our campus. Um, but we do not have all the answers, so we would absolutely welcome um, any input you might have on how we can improve as well. Definitely. So we'll begin by kind of diving into how Pete and I as advisors provide leadership and professional development opportunities to the students. So we first begin by really kind of understanding that each student has their own personal reason for um, participating in Dance Marathon, you know, be it their personal connection to the cause or being involved in Dance Marathon previously, either at a different institution as a transfer student or even graduate students is something that Jagathon has explored over the past few years or in high school. Um, some students are interested in participating because of the leadership opportunities that it provides, meeting new people, making new friends, um, knowing that it's the opportunity to make a difference. Academic interest is something that kind of leads students to participate in Dance Marathon if they're interested in, you know, business or fundraising, um, organizational leadership, event management. There are definitely a lot of opportunities to develop those skills and boost resume there. And then we recently kind of found through a survey that program acclaim is something that motivates the students a little bit more than what we had thought, you know, with many of these programs being among the larger um, student involvement experiences on the campuses that that is something that students kind of gravitate to a little bit. So knowing each of these um, individual motivations and I'm sure many more different motivations um, is really important so that the students know where you're coming from and you know where they're coming from as well. So we'll go into a little bit our strategy meeting schedule that we have with the students. So Pete and I hold regular meetings with the students to help them develop and flesh out their plans for the year. Um, it's important to us that we get in a regular meeting schedule that helps us establish accountability within one another as well as frequent communication among the students and their committees. So each of these student meetings are student led. That's really important to us that, you know, this is a student led organization and each of these meetings are very much the same. So we ask that the students prepare for the meetings by, you know, putting together an agenda. It's a good skill for them to have anyway and helps keep the meetings on track. 
Um, we offer insight and ask the students questions to make sure they are thinking about all the possible outcomes of a strategy and just give them as much input as we possibly can. Then to the left of this slide, you'll see that we've included Jagathon's leadership structure. So it starts with one president who oversees four divisions that are led by one VP, and they, they have directors under them who um, create their own individual committees. We have 20 committees um, in Jagathon overall, and each of those committees have the freedom to create their own subcommittees um, each year. It changes depending on the year and what those directors see fit. So um, this is something that we've really invested a lot of time into kind of getting right over the years, but we're we're open to always kind of taking a look at it each year and making sure that, you know, membership has all of the right committees under it and that it's titled appropriately and that these committees and positions are ultimately something that transfer well on resumes. So a few years ago, we changed um, what was dancer relations to participant relations, a more inclusive term. And also um, it kind of helps um, get across on their resume what they're really doing in their role. And so one area that, that Allie and I um, help provide leadership and, and development opportunities for the students uh, is in regards to our um, partner debriefs. And so in terms of uh, debrief meeting preparation, we work with the students uh, in putting together presentations um, in front of campus and community partners that we work with. Um, they craft their, their uh, how they want the, the meetings, the debrief meetings to flow. They rehearse. Um, we coach them on, on, on what best practices are and how to approach um, communicating with our campus leadership uh, as well as, as corporate executives. Um, and then we talk to the students about kind of reading the situation um, and understanding when it would be appropriate to actually move forward with um, maybe the next year's partnership and make a, a sponsorship ask in the moment. Um, and then where appropriate, depending upon who the partner is, Ali or I will, will attend the meeting, uh, meetings with the students. And this is primarily, um, you know, it's twofold. You know, one of the reasons, and, and I think for the partner itself to have um, someone who's a fellow staff member or kind of the, the professional um, campus employee with the students, it, it helps the students to get, gain a little bit of credibility in the conversation. Um, but we're also there, uh, you know, the students, they will plan the meetings, they will schedule the meetings, they will run and lead these meetings. But we help them prepare for those meetings and then we attend uh, and we, we kind of serve as a backup to them so that if something happens in the meeting that is unexpected or unforeseen or a question is tossed their way that they're not really sure how to field, they can defer to us so that we can help them um, manage that conversation in the best possible way and thus learn how to be better. And so as students do more and more of these debrief meetings, um, they actually get, they get better at it, um, not surprisingly. And I'll talk a little bit further about this later in the presentation. And so a, another piece of, of um, what Allie and I have worked um, to, to build in um, leadership and, and, and development opportunities for our students is our Jagathon class. And so the Jagathon class, um, we actually just finished our second year of holding this class. It, it is uh, a, a, a partnership with the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy on our IUPUI campus, um, where each of our 25 executive board members is uh, offered a three credit hour academic experience in the spring semester, which is aligned with when we hold our main event. And it was really an acknowledgement that the work that the students were doing experientially uh, already met um, any guidelines that would be necessary if we teased them out and, and actually showed um, our, our academic unit within Lilly Family School of Philanthropy that these students, they deserved course credit. And so really we just sort of formalized, um, you know, we formalized what the class structure would be and our meetings in the spring semester become actual class sessions. And we really haven't added much to the experience because the students are clearly very busy uh, in their own right, planning and executing the event from an experiential standpoint. But we've implemented some guest speakers on a week to week basis. And they talk about um, uh, specific topics that are related to the work we do in, in Dance Marathon to help deepen uh, the, the, um, the knowledge that our students have. They're practitioners but it's good to take a step back and learn about 
um, the academic side of the work that they're doing to get a deeper understanding of it. But it also allows us, um, Allie and I, as the advisors, uh, to formalize certain learning outcomes and organizational processes that we have. So things like leadership transition from one year to the next, we can insert that into the class so that we formalize the structure and it becomes a grade for the outgoing student to help um, make sure that the incoming student is up to speed. Um, things like communication plans, fundraising plans, even getting down to elements like our DMLC um, speaker applications and uh, award applications nominations for our program become course assignments. These are things that we need to be doing anyway. Um, they are things that I think uh, for a mature program, you should be involved in all these tasks. And so from our perspective, what it does is it, is it helps the students gain a grade for doing work that they needed to do anyway. And it moves the timeline back so that we're much more prepared um, when the time is right to apply for things or transition. And so um, the final aspect that we're going to discuss um, when it comes to providing leadership and professional development opportunities is actually uh, career preparation. Um, and and we, we, you know, by no means are, are we, um, you know, we're not all encompassing when it comes to helping students um, gain gainful employment post-graduation. But what we do is it's more of a, um, an acknowledgement and a, a recognition um, that the work that our students are doing already um, has natural learning outcomes. Um, and I think as an advisor, many of you probably already understand that. Um, things like fundraising experience, leadership experience, marketing experience, strategic planning, business writing and communication, public speaking and presentation, um, event planning, relationship building, lots and lots of different things that our students are learning in the process of planning and executing these dance marathons. And it's important for us to help at least be a piece to um, maybe help our students think a little bit more deeply about how this experience is shaping their greater undergraduate experience and how it might help them segue into the next chapter of their life post-graduation. So one piece of this for us is during our class, we actually have a guest lecturer and, and um, one class session that is dedicated to resumes. So we can talk about to our students about how they might go about um, encompassing their experience within dance marathon in a resume in such a way that it demonstrates to a prospective employer the um, the skills that they have taken from the experience so this experiential behavioral based kind of an approach so many times students when they're when they're um, heading out into the workforce um, you know they're a few months away from graduation and they're they're starting to interview for that first real opportunity post graduation and it's a behavioral based interview where that that HR person is saying, tell me about a time when and what Allie and I have, have started to note over the course of years is so many of our students will come back to us and say, I just had the interview for my dream job out of college and it went so well and I think they may offer me that job and it's so weird. I spent the entire time talking about my dance marathon experience. Tell me about a time when. Uh, you led a team. Tell me about a time when you developed a strategic plan. Tell me about a time when you delegated um, conflict resolution. You name it. This program teaches our students in a real world setting how to build these, these skills that are very transferable to the professional sphere. And many of these skills are unlikely to be garnered anywhere else in an academic setting. We provide value to our students and it's incumbent upon us that we help our students understand and realize that and better prepare for those situations so that they can take the best advantage of it when they are in that space. So another element that we've worked more and more on is um, leveraging LinkedIn. We have a Jagathon LinkedIn page. Um, it, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. LinkedIn is actually an avenue for peer-to-peer -peer online fundraising. If you have not considered it, you should. It's a completely different sphere of individuals um, and depending upon the approach you use, it will resonate. You can raise money through it. But beyond that, from a career preparation standpoint, we encourage all of our student leaders to build their own um, profiles on LinkedIn and to start to tease out as they go through the experience some of the skills that they gain through the, some potentially difficult situations or some successes or some shortfalls. These are all learning opportunities and we try to bring that forth to the students to say, hey, this would be a good thing to maybe talk about in your LinkedIn profile so that as they start to interact with recruiters, 
um, the real breadth and depth of this experience comes through. And now we'll move into uh, the next segment of the presentation on fostering student success. And I'll start by talking about availability and accessibility, which may not um, be clear uh, its role in, in helping to foster student success. But I think it's very important um, that your students, that you're communicating with your student leaders to let them know when it is appropriate to, uh, to reach out to you how you want them to reach out to you, um, and when you're gonna be there for them, what kinds of things that you can do to help them out. Um, it helps to set boundaries and set expectations so that your students know kind of what the cadence of the relationship ought to be. And, and Ali mentioned before, having a series of standing meetings that we hold, um, that's a good framework for our students in general because they understand, okay, we have an executive board meeting at this time, Pete and Ali will be in that meeting. If I have some Jagathon business I need to discuss, I will bring it with me to that meeting. Or it could be a, a meeting of our president and vice presidents or a one-on-one -on -one with our president. Or it could be specific planning sessions that we hold um, to put together a fundraising push or a marketing strategy, a communication plan, what have you. Having those scheduled meetings on the books with student-driven agendas uh, lets them know, okay, Pete and Allen are going to be in this meeting and they're going to be there. I can, I can use them as, um, to bounce ideas off of, to help vet my ideas, to get advice, um, to make sure that we're going down the right path when it comes to helping to develop our strategies for the program. But beyond that, students oftentimes have um, needs and um, uh, a, a desire to connect with you outside of that normal predetermined space. And, and from my perspective, I think, you know, I welcome that. I think it's part of the relationship building process and letting the students know that you're there for them. But I also think that it's got to be done in such a way that um, acknowledging the other work that all of us are doing. I mean, very few, I don't know about the rest of you, but for Allie and I, this is one piece of our portfolio for our jobs. And so we have many other things to do and we've got to balance all of the things that we need to accomplish professionally um, and know that we want to be there for our students. But you know, letting a student know like, hey, that 11.45 um, p.m. text message was not welcome. Um, this is when you should be reaching out to me. This is when I'm there for you. Um, this is how I like to be communicated with. This is when I want to be communicated with. When we meet, this is where I'd like to meet. I think particularly when we have kind of the virtual space that we're in right now, setting those boundaries is, 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 is super critical. Uh, but also, you know, your students are going to come to you at times with things outside of the scope of dance marathon. They're going to ask you about their academics. They're going to get ask you about professional advice. And I think it's important that you do what you can to be there for them and, and be that that sounding board where they can get some some quality advice to make the best possible decisions. But it's got to be done in such a way that you can manage your involvement with the program as well as their involvement with the program. So next we'll kind of dive into um, how Pete and I determine priorities for the program and for us as advisors. So uh, individually we create our own focus areas for the year. It helps us to manage our time and this can be based on a number of things. It can be based on your personal skill sets or experiences that you may have or the organization's priorities in the given year. So for example, for me, my focus areas for the upcoming school year include virtual engagement. I'm sure that's no surprise to any of you. Um, activation rates for the program and then external communication, be it with alumni, participants, partners, and then our high school programs. And then even still, um, before the students approach Pete and I with these questions or conversations, we expect that they've communicated internally with their peers before reaching out to us. Um, but these are the topics and these are the questions that we don't typically turn away. And then anything outside of that scope, strongly defer to the students on, it's their program to run. And then again, it kind of helps us to manage our time um, professionally as well with um, specific to the dance marathon. As far as um, the meetings that Pete and I choose to attend alongside the students, um, you know, definitely think about this in terms of how it looks for your specific program. But for us, these are meetings with campus leadership and then long-term higher level, usually Jagathon partners. Again, we don't speak for the students, but are there to back them up when and if needed, and then providing that year-over-year -year continuity with the partners that, you know, when we commit to something with each of these partners, they know that a staff member is, you know, giving their, their promise on it as well. 
And then as Pete kind of mentioned um, in the last slide, being there for the fun moments as well as the work helps build, helps build rapport with the students, um, builds trust, and makes those inevitable challenges later on in the year a little bit easier to navigate. Then kind of in that same vein, just recognizing that the little things really do matter and add up. Um, we talked earlier about how the students join for many different reasons, including professional development. I can't tell you how many letters of recommendation, especially Pete, has written over the years, mock interviews, we've provided resume reviews, that sort of thing. Um, the students are investing so much of their time and their um, you know, so much of themselves into dance marathon and they go into these spaces and they talk about their dance marathon involvement that we want to kind of, you know, support them in that endeavor and help them put their best foot forward. And also knowing that they're an extension of the program and, you know, how they portray the program is how others in the community will see it too. So that's important to us. And um, you'll see on this slide here, we have a graphic that kind of details Jagathon's proofreading process. Um, no, Pete and I do not proofread all of the emails and documents that the students come up with. There's no need for that, and even if there was a need, we don't have time to do it. Um, but we kind of take a look at the more higher level um, messages and documents that go out, often with, um, you know, campus leadership, um, sponsors, our high school programs, our friends at Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. We take a look at those um, to, you know, one, put our uh, best foot forward in those um, communications, but also to really help the students develop their professional writing skills. Those are some really important skills that are um, developed through Dance Marathon and are taken with the students for many years to come. And it's kind of interesting to see how the students' writing styles begin at the in the earlier phases of the year and how much they develop throughout the year as they, you know, become more um, comfortable and adept at um, professional writing and kind of adopt that Jagathon voice, if you will. And then kind of in that same vein, um, equipping the student leaders to become the best possible ambassadors of the Dance Marathon program. Like I said, they are an extension of the program and that representation is really important. You know, when they're going out on campus to other organizations, their professors even, their classmates, and then into the community um, and beyond, they're representing the program and we want to make sure that they, you know, know how to do that in such a way that they're painting the program in as positive of a light as possible. And um, so representation and helping um, the students really um, be equipped to do that has been a focus of Pete and mine over the years. So we'll next get into um, garnering campus support. And it's something that Jagathon has really kind of grown in over the past few years, but is always growing on for sure. Um, we're grateful for a lot of support from our administration at IUPUI. Um, so we first start with making connections. Uh, Pete and I work with the students each year to review their prospect list prior to them reaching out to ask for a meeting. You definitely want to know when the students are reaching out to your colleagues and also we want to provide them with the best contact information possible and then any context that we as staff members would just naturally have that the students wouldn't have in their in their position that can be you know okay you're reaching out to the business school that's great be sure to reach out to this person and then you know cc their assistant to make sure that they see it those little things that we again as staff members would know just from communicating with our colleagues on a day-to-day -day basis that the students wouldn't yet know and gives them the best opportunity Opportunity to connect with with that office or that school or that entity. Um, in addition to prior partners with the program, we encourage the students to research campus entities at IUPUI and community organizations with a desire to support healthcare initiatives, um, children, or education and leadership development. Um, just like each of the students um, join Dance Marathon for a different reason, as we talked about early on, um, partners are no different. They um, support these programs because they have a specific motivation for doing so. And if you get lucky, they may have um, multiple motivations for, for supporting the program. So encouraging the students to really do their research and um, figure out who is the best to connect with and reach out to will really serve them well. So as far as maintaining these partnerships, 
that's definitely a big piece where Pete and I as the advisors come in to play as being, as we've mentioned a few times now, that um, year over year continuity, we're that constant in the program that, um, you know, fellow staff members or um, leaders at community organizations can be like, oh yeah, I know Pete or I know Allie, um, and they, they come to recognize us. So as a program, remember that the goal um, of achieving mutual benefit in all partnerships is very important. It's not just about what's in it for the dance marathon program, but what's in it for the sponsoring organization as well. It's what keeps them coming back year after year. Um, work with your students on creating unique sponsorship opportunities and you'll be really impressed with what they come up with for sure. They have a lot of awesome ideas, creative ideas, not just for um, stewardship, um, the day of the event uh, or the days of the event, but um, kind of year long as well. So really allow them to kind of run with some stewardship ideas that they may have. And you'll see on this slide that we've listed a few different entities that, you know, Jagathon has been for, um, fortunate to partner with over the years. I'm sure that many of you have thought of these and many more already. Um, that's awesome. Uh, we kind of wanted to go through a few of the examples of some of the more unique partnerships that we've come up with over the years. So, um, for example, you'll see on there it says local sporting events, festivals, conferences. Um, we're in the heart of Indianapolis and um, it is a big conference city, a big athletic city as well. Um, so Jagathon partners with many local running organizations to volunteer at their events in exchange for monetary donations. So it began about five years ago now, um, Jagathon has partnered with Indianapolis Monumental Marathon, which is about a 20,000 person running event in downtown Indianapolis. And we provide about 200 to 250 volunteers to serve as the course marshals for that um, marathon. And we've done it for a few years now, like I mentioned, and word has gotten out that it's something that we're experienced in. The students do really well managing and planning for throughout the year. And that, you know, being a large organization, um, we can provide quite a lot of volunteers from, you know, the same, from the same organization, which is really a benefit to um, those those partners that there's continuity in your volunteers. So we've gotten a lot of other opportunities in Indianapolis and beyond um, to volunteer at those sporting events just from that one experience that's gone well each year. Um, another example is Jagathon has a unique partnership with the IUPUI Office of Undergraduate Admissions where the office provides monetary partnership to each of Jagathon's high school dance marathon programs in exchange for speaking time and engagement with each of the schools, which it works out really well for them because they get to have that face time with the students during that, you know, pivotal time of their lives when they're figuring out their, their next step um, for college and that sort of thing. Um, the admissions office even provided application waiver codes to the students and it's something that was definitely a mutual benefit like we mentioned earlier. And then last example that we'll give is that we have a partnership with a statewide credit union who offers a debit card with both Jagathon and IUPUI's logo on it. Um, and the credit union donates a few cents off of each transaction back to Jagathon in the months leading up to the event. So it's a PR opportunity as well as a fundraising opportunity. So, you know, we really brainstorm with the students and think through, okay, what would be ideal? What, you know, if we could, you know, draft up this partnership to be as, you know, creative and awesome as we'd like it to be, how can we approach a partner with these ideas and, you know, really sit down with them and have a conversation on how to grow it and um, make it the best that it can be. So don't be afraid to go to your partners with those great ideas. It's beneficial for them too. Now, uh, circling back to our discussion about uh, partner debriefs in terms of, of um, how that helps our students um, connect with our partners in such a way that our partners want to continue working with us into perpetuity, which is such an important piece. Um, our students, we found, er you know, particularly I, I found early in my career, uh, advising the group. They were very good about identifying prospective partners and going out and kind of pitching them on the idea of supporting uh, our marathon. What we weren't quite so good at was after the event was over, circling back to them and saying, did we 
did we fulfill everything we promised we would we would do for you? Did we um, did we get your opinions and thoughts on on the um, you know your interaction with our program and talk about how we can improve? So we started working with a very intentional partner debrief process where at the end of the event and we're kind of in the in the, in the heart of that season right now. Um, it's a little bit different in, in the Zoom environment, but um, we're, we're able to do it. But in a, in, in a normal circumstance, our students, um, we would reach out to our partner, we would set up a meeting, uh, the students would ensure that either Ali or myself could be in on that meeting. The students would print off copies of the presentation that they're going to deliver, they would print off copies of our partnership packet, and they would lead with a thank you. And I think that's so, so important with all of your partners. It doesn't matter what they do for you, it's an acknowledgement that they are doing something for you, whether that's providing you food, gift certificates, a monetary partnership, or any number of things that they can do to support you. It could be simply that they're giving you a discount uh, from the normal fees that they would they would charge a client, it's still um, they're they're helping you out. I think you you've got to really reinforce to the students the importance of lead with the thank you. And so we go in and we thank the, these partners for for their generosity. Um, we talk to them about um, you know the, the experience. We we talk about what Jagathon accomplished in the year, what that partner's role was in helping us accomplish what we accomplished. And then asking them, how was it for you? And I think that's such an, it, it's such a common sense question that is so easily missed to go back to your partners and say, you know, this was our partnership this year and it was phenomenal for us. How was it for you? Did you get out of it what you wanted? Were there things we could have been better at? How can we be a better partner to you? And that's such a powerful question to a lot of partners because quite frankly, in the space of student organization leadership on college campuses, they do not get asked that very often. And you can set yourself apart from so many organizations on your campus simply by setting up a formalized debrief process where after they have given you what you've asked for and you don't, from their perspective, have any obligation to circle back, you do circle back and you talk to them about their experience in your event, leading up to your event, what you provided them on social media, what kind of metrics you have, how many people liked it, what the reach that, you know, how much reach did you help those partners extend to, bringing some of that data, but also the anecdotal stuff like, um, Aflac, thank you for joining us at, at our event. Um, you brought, you know, you brought the Aflac duck with you and, and our, our, fam, our, our, our hospital families, they were just, through the roof, excited to play with this 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 piece of hospital mission, you know equipment, you know things like that. Just really being able to 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 talk about what that partner provided to you, but making sure to ask them how was it for you, and then in the process of having that conversation, um, and and I think we, we do a lot of kind of role playing in in um, walking through what the what the debrief process might look like for the students so that they can see, the students can see how the meeting might go in some different directions and when it would be appropriate to talk about the renewal. To say, it seems like we had a great experience and you had a great experience. How would you feel about, um, let's do it again next year, but maybe take it to the next level and what might the next level look like? And always kind of, you know, being thankful, but leading with questions to find out um, motivations for these organizations, as, as, as Ali mentioned, there, there's so many different reasons why a partner might want to be uh, involved. You know, we partner with our parking services on our campus and our parking services, um, quite frankly, they're looking for some good PR. So understanding that and saying, what can we do as a charity to give them a platform with some really good PR? Other organizations may be looking for associate engagement where they want to volunteer alongside and interact with students. Some may want to have access to your committee in some way that as long as there are synergies there where it's mutually beneficial, um, worth considering perhaps. And then moving into uh, the last section of, of this session on facilitating program growth. So, you know, one element of um, of being an advisor to a dance marathon program is is how to go about supporting um, your program's outcomes, and I think many of you um, are probably uh, have experienced much the same as 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 Allie and I have in terms of um, many of our student leaders are very much in kind of the annual um, fundraising mode of maximizing how much fundraising is going to happen in this school year. Um, you know. Your president is a, going into their final year of their undergrad. 
Um, he or she is very interested in raising as much money as possible in that given year. And every now and again, we'll notice that um, the importance of the advisory function, thinking three to five years out, making sure that what that student leader wants to do this year to maximize fundraising is actually um, to the benefit of the program, not only in that one year, but long term, that it's not damaging the overall health of the program. Um, and, and the program continues on into perpetuity and that this experience, this opportunity is available to your student leaders um, of the next generation student leaders. Um, so ensuring that our students are thinking uh, not only about how they can raise as much money as possible right now, but also um, that they're keeping the health of the program long term into consideration. So we provide feedback. Um, also on things like fundraising, recruitment, engagement strategies. So uh, these are important. Ali and I only have so much time, as many of you um, likely, likely do as well, that you have to kind of pick and choose where you put your efforts in trying to help the program move forward. And certain things, you understanding the priorities of which uh, aspects of the program must be successful. So that six-figure fundraising push day, uh, you're probably going to want to look at that fundraising plan and really have it uh, teased out well. Um, working with the students to create, you know, in essence, SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats of your program. And for you to understand that as the advisor, so you can go into these strategic sessions and work with students to ensure that they have thought about all of the questions that need to be answered, that they've, they've answered, um, you know, if, if they've worked through all of the, the, the details that can oftentimes make the difference between success and falling short of, of goal. Um, and so Allie and I, we're not going to do the work for the students, but we are going to work with them to ensure that they have a fully fleshed out, fully vetted plan, and that they are ready and prepared to execute it uh, from A to Z so that we can uh, realize the outcomes that, that we have set in our goals. We do things like reviewing contact lists. We proofread documents, to Allie's point. Um, we proofread uh, only a certain portion, if the students want to reach out to somebody like the president of the university, the chancellor of our campus, those are going to be messages that Allie and I want to take a look at and vet the language and ensure that, um, that they are uh, appropriate to send the message and that we're, um, you know, that, that, they're, that it's a nice clean message with the right tone and that it um, acknowledges prior partnership as well. The other students will proofread, self-proofread one another. So all of the messages of our executive board, just as an FYI, they all get proofed. So the students proofread each other, uh, and that helps them not only to be better writers, but it helps them to be better editors, and it also helps the group as a whole to kind of sync up uh, toward the end of the year. It's hard to tell the difference between um, one director's form of communication through email versus uh, a vice president's form of communication through email because we start to have uh, a lot of the same, um, you know, ways in which we, we put, construct our communications and the tone of the communications tend to be very similar as we start to sync up throughout the year. We work through budgets uh, as well as purchasing anything that needs to be purchased. Those are also pieces that we do to, um, that we help support um, within, you know, to, to lead to the outcomes of the program that we're, we're looking for. Um, and then obviously compliance with, with university policy. And so um, we have, we've developed a worksheet and this is primarily um, for what might be considered the off season, the, um, the time immediately following the marathon up through uh, the start of the fall semester for us since we're on March, uh, first weekend in March is when we hold our main event. So from March, through late August when our fall semester starts would be kind of what you would consider our off season. And that's where we want to accomplish a lot of things like transitioning and making sure that it's an effective transition where the incoming executive board member has a really good idea about what the plan was last year, uh, how well that plan was executed and followed, whether it was a good plan, if there were things we needed to change, what went well, what we have to work on to get an idea about what's the next iteration of that committee that that individual is going to run going into the year. But also things like our strategic planning, our annual planning, um, setting our goals and how we're going to go along the journey to, um, um, to exceed those goals. And one element that um, is sometimes lost um, in, in the advisory function is, is the celebration of your program's history and impact. And, uh, you know, as, as Ali and I both have mentioned multiple times throughout this presentation, um, you're the continuity piece for your program. 
and, and many of your programs, these dance marathon programs are, are legacy programs on your campus. Um, they're sometimes the largest student organizations. They've won lots of awards. They've raised lots of money, done many, many great things. And I think it's important um, for you to kind of have your finger on the pulse of the fact that, you know, every two, three, four years, you're cycling through every one of your student leaders. And because of that, if you don't make sure that there is a point in time that you are sharing the history of your program with your team, you're going to get down the road and realize that you've got a group of, of executive board leaders that really don't have a firm understanding about where the program has come from, what it's accomplished. And what that does is it really, it enriches the experience for those executive board members. And it also gives them uh, a sense of ownership, but also a sense of, um, you know, they're standing on the backs of other student leaders that help build this program. And there, it gives them a sense of, you know, I have a responsibility to, to rise to the challenge and be the very best executive board member I can because there's a lot of people that help build this program and it's my job to continue to build the program and not let anyone down. And I think that's important for the students to get a sense of um, in moving forward with your program. And so um, I'll close out my piece of this by, by talking about the importance of keeping the student journey in your mind as you're the advisor. Um, sometimes because your position as the advisor is fairly static and stationary, you sort of are, are um, at the 30,000 foot view looking at the entire of the organization. It's important to see that there are really steps in the process for a lot of our students. A lot of our students, um, you know, early on, maybe in their freshman year in college, they'll uh, learn about you through, you know, whatever orientation or weeks of welcome process your campus has. Um, they'll take a flyer, raise a little bit of money, show up for the event, and then you'll knock their socks off and blow them away with how great your program is run. And they're like, wow, that's really awesome. Some of them will just say, that's really awesome and I wanna do that three more times. Others are gonna say, you know what, that's awesome. I wanna be a part of um, making that happen. And then they're gonna join the committee. And then, you know, so they're gonna come back in their second, third, fourth year and be a committee member to help you not only put on the event, but fundraise and help give that you know, magnificent experience to your campus. And then the select few of those students are gonna have a desire to move up to the highest level of leadership to develop the strategy and kind of steer uh, you know, the program as a whole and move on to your executive board. And then obviously at the end of this, if we're doing our job well, if our campuses are doing their job well, um, we're gonna graduate these students out and they're gonna move on into the next chapter of their professional life and become Dance Marathon alumni. And so it's important that we understand these different stages and that they look very different from one student to the next, but that we help continue to move students from, from kind of one segment to the next if that's what they're interested in, giving them the information and the motivation to move along up to the executive board if that's something that they're interested in. But also once they graduate, how are we gonna to continue to keep them in the fold, keep them connected to our program and our campus and our hospital and CMNH. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Allie to talk to you a little bit more about that. Yeah, to kind of segue off of um, Pete's discussion about alumni engagement, um, quite a large part of Pete's and my jobs as advisors involve alumni relations. Now, um, this in large part is because of our role with the IU Foundation. However, um, because an advisor is very much a constant in the organization and someone that the alumni recognize after, you know, perhaps being multiple years um, removed from the organization, I, we think that this would be an important focus area for all advisors to kind of dabble in a little bit. Um, we provide context on alumni as to what their roles were when they were involved and any personal details that might be of note when attempting to reconnect with those alumni. Um, we also help the students manage alumni databases, which is quite a job for sure, but it's definitely one to be kept up on year over year. Um, so it stays manageable and is really something that you as a program are able to utilize each year. Um, we reach out to alums to just ask to catch up with them, see how they're doing, um, share important organizational updates, ask for their feedback, and then invite them to events as appropriate. Um, remember that they are alumni for a reason. Um, each um, event that your organization is hosting might not be appropriate for an alum to attend. So really thinking intentionally about what makes sense for them to engage with and how can you provide a meaningful opportunity there. 
Um, and I kind of mentioned a little bit how we share important organizational updates. We send alumni and newsletters uh, about oh, once a quarter or so just, you know, to keep them in the loop, but um, to really differentiate between, um, you know, their alumni experience and their student experience. We have a um, student committee that manages this messaging, but Pete and I really kind of help them oversee the strategy to make sure that it does make sense for alum. And uh, so an example is that Jagathon recently uh, waived its registration fee for the upcoming Jagathon 2021 Dance Marathon event. And we thought that, you know, this is a big enough um, adjustment in our programming that our alumni might be interested in knowing about that and also knowing about it before the public does. So we um, implemented in our communication strategy that we message the alumni, you know, check in on them, let them know about, you know, where Jagathon's at right now. Um, offer to um, have a Zoom meeting during these times to catch up, but you know, let them know that we wanted them to be the first to know about this important update for the year. And then, you know, keeping in mind for at least our program, it's an anniversary year for us, the 20th anniversary year, keeping um, up with those sorts of things, as Pete mentioned about acknowledging the history of the program, that's something that the alumni will really um, gravitate to quite a lot, the nostalgia piece of everything. So. Jagathon has a lot of room to grow in this area, but it's a focus of ours to um, also prepare graduating members to begin their journey as Jagathon alumni. So um, something that we're, you know, trying to continue to learn in, but this is where we're at so far with it. So to kind of close everything out, key takeaways for the presentation, um, each student joins for a different reason. We've touched on that quite a lot. Execution of the program itself provides meaningful learning outcomes for each of the students. That is exec members all the way to committee members and participants. Advisors pro provide program continuity. Thinking three to five years out is a really big piece of that. Um, viewing the advisory role as a mentorship with the students. Um, students represent the dance marathon to the campus and then represent their institution to the community. So really preparing them for how to go about that in the best possible way is a big piece of the advisor's role. And then celebrating your program, your students, and creating a strong vision for the future is something that Pete and I continue to focus on. Uh, I also want to add that there is real value in utilizing the full calendar year, including summer, as much as you possibly can. I know that gets difficult sometimes, but it's been something that we focused on in, in recent years to really kind of help us to debrief on prior years, goal set for the year ahead, and um, you know, just utilize the time that we have to um, you know, create the best plan moving forward. So that is kind of the focus of the worksheet that Pete mentioned that we have on the DMLC website. So thank you for listening to our presentation. We hope that it was meaningful for you all and you could take away a thing or two from it. Um, please feel free to contact us um, if there's anything that you'd like to dive deeper into with us or if there is even an idea that you'd like to challenge us on. We are always, you know, looking to get better and improve our strategies and there's a lot that we have yet to learn, especially entering into this virtual space. So we welcome all feedback and collaboration and we appreciate you taking the time. Pete, Allie, thanks so much for sharing all of your wisdom with us. Um, and I hope our audience was able to take something away from your presentation. Um, but since I am the only one here live at the moment, I guess I get the privilege of asking a couple questions. Um, so I guess, first and foremost, you covered a lot in, in terms of the responsibilities of advisors, but um, I'm curious what each of you personally would say your, uh, your top priority is, uh, or maybe the way that you, you've spent most of your time advising Jackathon. I think for me, um, we've gotten into a space where our, our standing meetings alone um, tend to, to carve out a lot of my, my time. Um, and, and that's in terms of we have weekly meetings of our executive board on Sunday. So all 25 uh, of our executive board members and then Allie and I, we will meet every Sunday. Um, we take some Sundays off on the summer, but uh, more often than not, even over the summer, we're pretty much year-long program. There's only a handful of weeks that we, we take off. 
Uh, we meet weekly with our president and four vice presidents. So Allie and I meet with them every week and that meets pretty much every week. Um, we meet one-on-one -on -one every week with our president and then bi-weekly we meet with our president and then our, our, our hospital is um, Riley Hospital for Children. So our, our, our Riley liaison, Andrew Stallings, he'll meet with us bi-weekly. Um, and then Kristen Sheard, our CMNH um, dance marathon uh, coordinator, she'll meet with us monthly. So we try to have that cadence where um, I found that building the expectation of meeting on a regular basis, even if, uh, you know, early on for me, a lot of our students would be like, eh, we don't have anything going on. Let's just skip this meeting. I've found that for us, we always have stuff going on. Even if it's Wednesday and the meeting's on Sunday, by the time you get to Sunday, there's going to be stuff. Um, so a lot of the standing meetings take time. Um, I try to be as um, open. I have a, a fairly open door policy. So I try to just generally be there for the students. But I think the standing meetings are probably the single biggest time commitment for me. For sure. Um, I would agree with that, definitely. I spend a lot of time more on the finance side of the meeting. So we meet biweekly with our finance student leaders and um, Andrew Stallings, our Riley liaison, and um, just kind of go through our financial strategy and how we're tracking and that sort of thing. So that's a focus for me. But to get, um, you know, more specific to what I really focus on is the year long, um, like maintaining year long connectivity with the students. And it's really important during these times too to really think through how to do that intentionally and meaningfully. Um, you know, the students have had to transition we transitioned the entire executive board during a time where it's, you know, completely virtual. So kind of maintaining touch points throughout the summer regularly to check in on them, make sure they're doing fine and that they understand what their, um, what their role entails and what it entails during these times as well. Um, so for me, you know, during these times and regardless of, you know, the fact that you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I try to really maintain connection with each of the students and check in on them throughout the year because as we kind of talked about, Jagathon is very much a year long um, program. We really utilize the summer. We utilize the semester prior to our event and the semester of our event as well. So it's, it is pretty much, you know, March to March, nonstop um, meeting and programming. So checking in on them throughout the year is big for me because I know it's a long year and making sure that they're doing okay with it. Ali, you touched uh, briefly on just the virtual environment and, and doing things in, in the world of COVID-19. Um, I'm curious if the recent events just surrounding you know, COVID-19 and, and higher education shifting largely to a virtual socially distanced format. Is that changing any of your priorities for the year ahead or do you anticipate any additional challenges as you prepare for Jagathon? Yeah, definitely switching more towards um, just learning, learning how we can, um, you know, really create a meaningful student involvement experience virtually. You know, a lot of the universities and institutions across the country, I know around this time are, um, you know, figuring out what the fall semester plan and the spring semester plan is gonna look like for each of their respective institutions. So kind of using as much information as we get um, to figure out what is possible, like what is possible with event capacities and that sort of thing. And also planning kind of worst case scenario, like okay, if, if the main event has to be, you know, completely virtual, um, what, what programs do we need to be looking into to um, maintain a virtual presence for that, that time period? So, yeah, definitely virtual engagement is a, is a strong priority. And, um, you know, if, if this were a normal year, you know, what does normal look like, right? But um, our a priority of mine would have been um, activation rates and really boosting those for, for Jagathon. And that doesn't change, but the approach to how we kind of meet those goals does change. So just being open to learning from other dance marathon programs, but also collaborating with our partners in university events on campus to see how they have navigated the virtual environment so far with their event planning. So that's 
been helpful for us. And I'll also chime in um, briefly. We've had a lot more discussions than ever before about um, not being afraid to take a risk. Yeah. Saying, look, this year is going to be different. Um, if we try to plan a dance marathon like we've always planned a dance marathon, uh, as if it's going to happen, uh, as if we're going to be able to fit, you know, 1,500 plus people into our campus center, um, we might be moving down the wrong path. Now, it might be possible, we, you know, sometimes those corners are too far away to be able to peek around them to figure out what it will look like. But I think now, if ever there was a time to say that thing out there that you wanted to try out and you were a little afraid, this in a lot of ways, in my estimation, is the perfect year to try it. We've been looking at um, uh, going with a $0 registration fee, and we've been talking more and more about that in terms of you know, for my, you know, first eight years of, of advising the program, it was always $25 per person. It did not matter if you were executive, um, general committee participant, they all paid $25 to go. And, you know, we've noticed some shifts that we've kind of seen and, and trying to talk to people that know better than us about generational shifts where really we're looking at this generation and saying they want us to demonstrate them our value and then they will commit. Whereas the prior model is sort of we promise it's going to be a great experience. Commit to us, and then we'll show you a great time. And it hadn't hit us yet in terms of diminished uh, participant numbers yet, but we saw that it was quite possibly going to. And we thought, you know, let's just say that this $25 in the grand scheme of what we're doing is not that valuable. Let's make this open to everyone. And I think it, it talks to every everything in, the, in you know from a pandemic perspective is saying, look. Um, people may not have access to resources in the same way in terms of a student being able to give up $25 to come to this event. It takes off the table any fears of if we have to have virtual engagement and somebody saying, I committed $25 to go to an event and you're not having an event, I want a refund, we don't have to worry about that. But also from an, a, you know, an equitable standpoint, a, an inclusion perspective, instead of talking about how we want to be inclusive to everybody, let's actually take some steps and make ourselves available to everyone. And so you know, as we get further into it, I don't even think it's a risk, but in the moment, it's like, oh, forever we've been putting out, you know, th this model of we charge people $25, and this is the perfect space. Don't, that risk that you've been wanting to take for years, this is the, the time to take it, in my estimation, because it may very well be the smart move, um, and if it's not a good move, you were trying to move things forward in a very difficult, challenging space. So, that, that and that's a personal, um, you know, my personal approach to it. I think now's a good time to take some risks. Swing for the fences. This is a good year to swing for the fences, I think. I think that's great advice, and I'm, I'm excited to see what risks people choose to take this year and, and how that turns out for everyone. Um, but as we wrap up, Pete, Ali, I just want to, again, say thank you for taking the time with us at DMLC. Uh, to our audience, if you have any questions about today's session, I want to encourage you to check out the Discord um, where you can message Pete and Allie directly and have conversations with your peers about some of the topics that were covered in today's presentation. Um, and we will be having two live Q&A panels during the advisor workshop this week. So if you're not already making plans, uh, please be sure to check those out as well. Uh, thanks for joining us and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference.